Okay, we're back. We're live. It's one o'clock here in Honolulu, and we're talking to Steve Searcher. He's in Japan, in Kobe, Japan, at Kansai Gaidai University, uh, and he joins us uh, every couple of weeks, and we talk about how things are doing, looking to the east in Japan. Yeah. So, Steve, you know, I I, 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 I opened the Japan Times, which is right. done by the Yomiuri Shimbun, um, and I saw a lot of articles about COVID. COVID seems to be uh, occupying the, the national conscience, uh, consciousness these days, no? Oh, absolutely. It's uh, first and foremost the number one story in Japan. Today, it has been that way for you know, the last few months or so. It's affecting everybody, everybody. Um, you know, kids, if you, have, if you have children, of course, they're not going to school. Most of us, I think 60 or 70 percent of us are now working at home. Uh, the economy is uh, taking a dive, as we talked about in previous shows. Um, Japan went into a recession uh, in Q1, Q4 last year, 2019, the, with negative growth. This is before Corona, right? So Japan was already on the downward trajectory. And Q, Q1, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't have the final numbers for Q1, but they're predicting 5 to 6% negative growth, which I don't believe it'll be much higher than that. And then for Q2, uh, they're beginning to signal that it's going to be a bloodbath and that the negative growth will be in double digits up around 20, 22 percent. So Japan is moving into a severe recession. And most of the press, they talk about the Lehman, the Lehman crisis, the 2008, 2009 recession, grand recession. They call it the Lehman crisis here. They, they picked up on that name to describe it. They're saying this is nothing. Uh, the Lehman crisis is nothing compared to what Japan will be going through in the next year or so. So yeah, it's the number one story. It's uh, all of us. So, you know, I don't like Abe very much. I try and avoid listening to him. But last night, I actually listened to him to see what he had to say. He actually extended the national emergency in Japan for an additional month through the end of May. It was due to end uh, in a couple of days. That was the target set a month or so ago. And now it's been extended for one more month. So by far, this is uh, the number one issue, number one topic that everybody is paying attention to. That's yeah, interesting. You know, you say, uh, they say four or 5% and it's much more. They say uh, extended to the end of the month, it'll be much more. Um, they don't want to, you know, get people too excited about this uh, because, uh, you know, it's a matter of public confidence and confidence trans translates into the economy immediately uh, right. or <laughs> really soon anyway. Um, let, me, so, let me give you a fact, Jay. This. Uh, affects me since I'm an educator. Um, so many part-time jobs have been wiped out. These are restaurants, you know, service-related jobs. And the, the majority of those jobs are held by students. They're part-time jobs. They call them Arbeito. So I think comes derives from a German word. That's the word that they use to describe oh, Arbeit, them. sure. Arbeit means work in German. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's what the, you know, Japan borrows from many different languages, primarily English, but every once in a while Portuguese and German or other languages, French will appear. So those jobs are gone. And uh, the deal in, in Japan, is, as I observe it to Kansai Gaida, is that the parents pay for the tuition, but the students pay for everything else. That's the deal. So in order to pay for the other things, like food, for example, the students have to work, and now they cannot work. So there was a survey just a few days ago. 20% of Japanese college students may drop out because of this interruption in their study. Maybe they weren't that happy to begin with, but now that they can't afford to live, they can't afford to go to school, we could have a drop of 20% if the survey is correct. Is the government not helping them? Not so much the students. No, I don't think so. They're, they're, the support services are for regular workers that can demonstrate that their incomes have gone down significantly. Um, there is a nationwide subsidy program, kind of like what's going on in the United States. Have you got your money yet, by the way, Jay? Uh, no, I'm, and I'm not standing by the door waiting for it either. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone in Japan, all 125 million of us, including foreigners, are going to get uh, 100,000 yen sometime in the next couple of months or so. So the students are eligible for that, but that's a drop in the bucket. You know, that's, that's what does that good. translate to in dollars? Oh, sorry. That's about, in the current exchange rate, about $900 or so, $920, somewhere mm -hmm. in that range. Mm -hmm. So it's not a small amount, but it's certainly not a large enough amount 
to sustain a student through a semester if they can't work. So that's a signal of how disruptive the COVID is here in Japan. Well, the, do you feel that you, you know, sometimes I wonder about this myself. Do you, you feel that you're being unnecessarily pessimistic? Uh, could you be a little wrong? Um, I try and uh, be down the middle. I, I've done that in my business career. I, you know, I try not to be too much too pessimistic, overly pessimistic, or overly optimistic. I, am, you know, this is quite serious, and you know, you can see it in the GDP numbers. If, mm. if indeed this quarter, the Japan economy shrinks by a fifth, and that's going to impact many, many different industries, even the stalwarts like Toyota. Uh, are, they're laying people off right now and all companies have stopped hiring. There's just no hiring going on whatsoever right now. Mm. Everyone's in a holding pattern. Mm. So will we get out of this? Yeah, I, as an optimist, eventually I believe we will. When will that be? Um, will it be later this year? Uh, some economists are predicting the turnaround in Q3, that there'll be 10% growth. After the 22% drop in Q2, they... But I, I, that, that, I believe, is overly optimistic. I think this year is going to be rough. And it'll be 2021 before things turn around in Japan. Well, you're, you're, you're a, a professor of business and entrepreneurship and all that. Yes. And uh, not only that, you're a, kind of a comparative business professor because you're, you're associated with the Scheidler School also and American yep. business. And, and so you, can, you, have a, you have a clarity most people who only had a foot in one camp and not the other wouldn't have. And, and right. so you can see, you, you could see, you've been there for a while, you could see the, the economy declining prior to COVID. Yes. And now it's, uh, it's really declining much quicker with yes. uh, really no, 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 no safety net under it. And I'm wondering what, what Japan looks like to you as you look down the pike. I mean, what, what, what is it going to be? A soup kitchens? Is it going to be the demise of the you know, the big, uh, I forget the term you use for the big Japanese corporations. Kiretsus. Okay. Um, yeah, those, those are the interconnected businesses that are usually focused on a bank. Yeah. So my, I mean, my university we, is, a, is associated real, with one of those, actually. We're going to have a reshaping of the, you know, the essential structure of the, the Japanese um, business uh, community? Well, um, I hope so. <laughs> because <laughs> honestly, this is this is a silver lining in all of this. Um, Japan has been very slow to adapt to modern business trends, especially when it comes to technology. And this virus and the repercussions of it in Japan is exposing that so clearly that nobody can deny it any longer. I've been complaining for years about how Japan is not investing in IT infrastructure, it, it just isn't doing it. If you look at the relative percentages that companies spend on R&D, Japan's usually at a half, maybe a third of a, of a major mainstream American or European countries. So through this crisis, companies, the government, and universities too, my, my environment, are all recognizing that, hey, we, we need to up our game. So, Yes, there could be dramatic change, but some of that change could be for the better. Let me give you a small example. Uh, I think I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that uh, Japanese business custom for official documents include a chop, what's called in Japanese a hanko. You actually have to stamp the paper. It has to go through various organizations and each of them have to put their stamp on it. And then finally the, the shacho, the number one guy, We'll put his stamp and then all the stamps are assembled. Okay, we're good to go. So right now we're at the stay at home edict, right? It's a national emergency. Everyone's being told to stay at home. Don't go out unless it's for food or other things, necessary things. But business people are getting on the trains. They're still quite crowded and they're going to the office because they have to push their official stamp on these contracts, on this official paperwork to make payments and collect money and so forth. It's, this is 2,000 years old. This comes from China. It's just so far outdated, uh, but it continues on. But now Abe has recognized that this is an interruption in his policy. It's actually forcing people to come to work when he's telling them to stay home. And he's also recognized that this is, can be totally replaced by technology, totally. And there's 20 companies in Japan that exist today that could do this. 
So now he's announced that this will end. So that's one very small example of how these business traditions that have been holding Japan back and have not been changed just because the companies and the culture seems to be very slow to adapt to change. Now through the coronavirus, it's so clear that this is outdated and needs to be changed. It is happening. So before you go to the coronavirus, and I do want to talk about that, what about yes. these other culture points that, you know, Hawaii is um, more Akamai about Japan than most other places. And so, for example, the consensus model of management and, and business, uh, you have a large group of people. I mean, in the day back in the 80s, uh, when Japanese companies, and I want to say Taishoku, wasn't that the name? Uh -huh. big, big corporation. Okay. Um, okay. When they came here to buy property, usually buy property, yeah. there'd be 10 or 15 executives. And only one really ran it, but you had to look around the room carefully before you figured out who was the one. <laughs> yeah. it, and it was all apparently on the consensus model. Yes. Then there was this whole thing about cradle to grave. You join the company out of school, uh, you go through your whole life mm. um, till you retire, and it's, 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 uh, it's unruffled, it's straight line. Mm. And uh, you didn't really have to do anything as long as you kept your nose clean. And your career would be established um, on the basis of kind of momentum instead mm. of, um, you know, real, 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 um, you know, quality. Right. Uh, and, and then there were, then there was the thing about the, the room with the window. Remember the room with the window? Right. If you did something bad, you'd get yeah. a room with a window where you could look at uh, yeah, the well, window. It, it wouldn't be a room, but you'd be at the desk next to the window, which is a signal that uh, the next step would be to go out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but there were all these cultural things that, that seemed in, inconsistent, you know, with creativity, inconsistent with, um, you know, uh, good corporate, good corporate culture. Um, and they kept on happening through the time that the Japanese were buying all their properties here. Right. Um, and I wonder if those things are on the block now, whether those things might change. Yeah, well, that's that's a big, big question. You address several key aspects of Japanese culture and Japanese business culture. In terms of lifetime employment, I think that's still something that there's an image of, but I think when people look at it very closely, they realize that that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Because the companies laying people off right now are, are the companies that would not have done that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, like Toyota, like mm -hmm. Hitachi, those types of companies. So I think young people recognize that lifetime employment is not something they may want to have, but it's not something that they may get. So that is changing. 40% of the young people, when they graduate, they, they move into part-time jobs. Mm. There aren't enough full-time jobs for them to actually be employed. So they get caught in this kind of Starbucks part-time job phenomenon. This has been going on for 20, 25 years now. So that's the reality. I think people recognize that. In terms of Japanese business culture, yeah, I'm, I'm in a Japanese university. So what you described, uh, I live every day. That may be changing slightly through the virus, uh, through the COVID episode, but not really. In the end, there's one person who controls everything. Um, when I want to try and accomplish something, I have to go through many, many, many people. It's, uh, you know, as a foreigner, even though I've been here a long time, I recognize that it's still, I'm kind of impatient. You know, I, I, I like to get things done quicker than generally uh, I can do. So that I doubt will change all that much because that is really quite fundamental to how this country works. You know, it's, if you put it in perspective, Jay, and after World War II, this country was just devastated, right? And then by 1968, it was the number two economy in the world. So it, it worked amazingly well during that period of time to rebuild the country and turn it into this fantastic success. And it's still number three in the world. But these types of things are now a drag from my perspective as an outsider. Uh, are they going to change anytime soon? Uh, I, I don't think so. So, and you're right about uh, when I was negotiating with Hitachi, it was me. This is when I was working for Hewlett Packard. Me, and sometimes I would bring along a, a Japanese colleague, and, but he was there just to give me moral support because I was the one doing all the negotiation. And there'd probably be anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 people on the other side. And because I'd lived in Japan before, I knew the one person and he never spoke. 
the guy who doesn't speak is the one who has the most power. The people are talking. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I teach my students about this as well. So that will not change. That is just how things are done here. So that's fundamental to who, who Japanese people are, I think, and how Japanese operations work here. Yeah. So some things will change. The so Honko will go away. Uh, there's another discussion right now to change the Japanese academic calendar to the Western calendar. Right now, the academic year in Japan starts in April. So it puts it at odds with the rest of the world. So the spring semester for us starts in January. For them, it starts in April, which is totally out of sync. So that prevents foreign students from coming here in the spring. And it's hard for uh, high level universities to pull in visiting professors because they have the split schedule they have to deal with. So there's some discussion to kind of harmonize Japan academic calendar. So there will be some changes that are good, I think, that are going to come out of this. But in terms of the fundamental business culture and fundamental Japanese culture, Hostie says that doesn't change. That, that's, you know, I, you can argue with that, but his, his theory is that culture changes, or if it does change, it's very, very, very slow. Well, you, you talked about the, uh, the Arbeit group um, of young people who Arbeito, work at, yeah, exactly. Arbeito, uh, work at um, you know, part-time jobs, uh, right. jobs that do not have careers attached to them and all that and and that's you know that's different because back back when i was looking at it which is not that many years ago um <clears throat> uh that that was really not not the way a, a japanese graduate uh would want to spend his time uh so it's a certain deterioration also um in terms of crime and violation of social norms uh it was not permissible uh, all of japan would be ashamed of anyone who broke a social norm Mm -hmm. um come to find in the last what 10 or 20 years a lot of people break social norms uh mm -hmm. and uh you know they they do crime and they get prosecuted and it's gee it sounds like the u.s as a matter of fact um <clears throat> but it's it's different okay now now i give you that snapshot which has already had you know a decade or two of deterioration from the old way mm -hmm. um and then you, you you take no jobs you take companies that are unraveling uh, that really are going to be different and smaller and more efficient if they survive in the future. Right. And you people, people on the street, what does Japan look like then? I mean, is it soup kitchens? Is it social unrest? Uh, well, it's going to be a different Japan, isn't it? Um, you have to remember, Jay, that, that despite all of this turndown, this is still a very rich country. Uh, there's tremendous reserves of cash available and the monetary policy of uh, the Japanese government, this, this goes way back. You know, Abe's been doing this since he's been in power, which is I think around eight years now. His, uh, his stimulus, monetary stimulus, the Bank of Japan now owns 40%, the last I read owns 40% of all Japanese stocks. So the Bank of Japan is printing money, creating money and buying Japanese stocks to uphold the economy they've been doing this for years and years and years so there's this money machine actually the u.s is doing this now too the u.s has become similar in economic policy to japan the fed is now buying stocks and bonds right this is a part of the whole stimulus effort that's going under this these special circumstances in japan so the u.s fiscal monetary policy is what's japan, what is the same as what japan's been doing now for a long long time so there are tremendous reserves. Japanese people, uh, especially the older generation, have a lot of money in the savings account. So there's a buffer built into society that I think will prevent the worst case scenario from occurring that you're, you're describing. I'm actually more worried about the states because there you, you have, what, 40, 50 percent of the people are living paycheck to paycheck. And those paychecks now, are, in some cases, are gone. You know, what's going to happen there? It's, I think... U.S. economy, even though it's much, much bigger, uh, from a consumer perspective, consumer savings perspective, is, is more at risk than Japan. Yeah. <clears throat> That's my sense of it, Jay. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to what you uh, started on a, a little while ago. The, that is the, the Japanese effort at dealing with uh, COVID. Um, you know, what steps have been taken? How effective have, have they been? Uh, well, there, there's subsidies of, of uh, businesses and for consumers. There's loans available. Uh, there is the, the payment that I told you about that's going out to all 125 million Japanese will be made in the next couple of months or so. Um, at every level, uh, the government is saying, we want to help you. 
we want to do as much as we can. Abi last night was helping about a $10 billion uh, fund that's going to be created to help small businesses because uh, they're the ones that are really at risk. Those, those are the ones that are more on the thin line between operation and bankruptcy. <clears throat> so there's a lot of effort. Um, you know, I'm a little bit isolated from that aspect of the Japanese economy since I'm in a university environment. Our school is, you know, is financially sound. There's no issues really one way or the other about that. So there is a lot of um, investment in the society from the government. Um, there's a lot of generosity being exhibited by, by companies in donating, for example, protective gear, uh, because we also have the same issue here in Japan that the healthcare people who are on the front line um, there's enough masks in Japan, there's no shortage, but there's not enough protective gear. So Japanese companies are creating this, they're turning their manufacturing to making these ponchos or whatever they may be and giving them free. So I think there's a sense that there's an effort on the part of society, government, business, and so forth to try and overcome this. So I think We're that's- not abiding by the social distancing, abiding by the mask uh, obligation, uh, and for that matter, having testing. I mean, the problems that the U.S. Uh, has had continue, um, essentially. And I wonder if those problems exist in Japan and whether the Japanese response is better than the U.S. Well, uh, maybe relatively. Uh, the, the government has asked for social interaction to drop by 80%. That comes from the science. Apparently, if you get to below that number, the spread of the virus goes down dramatically. Has Japan achieved that? No. Um, you know, they, you can use a mobile phone. They, they do this in the States too, right? And measure activity. Yeah. You know, the the uh, cellular companies can measure people as they move around, yeah. supposedly anonymously, but Jay, they know where you are right now. I know. Yeah. They, they know you're talking to me right now. <laughs> but anyway. There's... It's okay. I'm proud of that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the numbers are in the 60, 65% range. So they're not quite to the extent that the government has asked, but there, it's not too bad. But if, if you go out, like I live close to a park, they're jammed. You know, people are getting, you know, they're buggy, staying home all the time. So, and you, especially when you have kids. So they're not adhering to that. And most people are wearing masks. This is, I was reading in, in America, that this has become a personal freedom issue in America to wear a mask or not. Yeah. But in Japan, it has a mask wearing culture. Every spring, People have hay fever because of the pine trees that are up in the hills. They, they cut down all the natural trees and put in pine. So they have a tremendous allergy problem in Japan. So at this time of year, usually 40% of the people are wearing masks anyway. So there's no issue there. So I would say probably 90% of people are wearing masks now when they're outside. But there are exceptions. There's a basketball court right across the street from where we are right here. And there were 10 kids out there playing no masks. You know, the security guard came by the university and kicked them out because you're not supposed to be exercising. So individuals are making decisions to kind of do what they've done in the past. But I would say for the most part, most people are adhering to the requests from the is, government. Is there talk of a second wave? Uh, yeah, maybe in, in the fall, potentially. So there's some articles that I've read about that, that this is what we're going through here will be repeated. Uh, down the way. I, I think in the, the pandemic that occurred in the early 1900s, that my, my mother was actually telling me that her mother, grandmother, who was in San Francisco at that time and saw all of this, said the first wave was bad, the second wave was even worse. And that came through in the following year. So it was a two-year episode for that particular epidemic. Mm. So yeah, there's some recognition that that may occur again. But the numbers, they are kind of moderating. Um, they're not going down, which is why the national emergency has been extended. But uh, there's a sense that the society overall is cooperating for the most part, not, not to the level the government is asking, but the majority of people are adhering to it. Well, as you said, Japan is um, a very high tech place. It has a lot of well-educated people in science Mm -hmm. um, and that would include bio, biotechnology, biochemistry, um, medical research. And so you mentioned a couple of times ago, a couple of our shows ago, about a drug called, as I re recall, the name was Ab Abigon, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is um, a laboratory owned by Fujifilm. Uh, 
right. um, which is a therapeutic rather than a vaccine. But query, any more news about them? I haven't read so much about that. I mean, they are moving forward and they're offering uh, to distribute the drug worldwide. So that's very, very good. Uh, they mentioned 20 different countries that they're going to distribute the drug to, um, but not too much. Mm -hmm. uh, though, what, the, what about other drugs? What about the rem, uh, I forget the rem, name of the one. is coming up, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah, that's the one that the government is focusing on right now because that seems oh. to have the best prospects. So Japan is negotiating with Gilead, I think is the name of the company. Maybe I'm mispronouncing that uh, to try and bring that particular drug into Japan. But again, Japan's numbers... It's about 13, 14,000. I haven't checked in the last couple of days. I was reading, Jay, for your own mental health, you shouldn't look at the stats every day. I mean, I guess you, you have to because it's your job. But I was, Consumer Reports sent out this thing, how to maintain your mental health. And this one thing it said is don't check the news every day. But still, on, you know, on balance, Japan is relatively moderate. We're still in the 13 to 15,000 range in terms of number of infections. And that's what that's less than a day in America, right? America is 20, 20,000 a day or plus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We're, well, I said we're, we're number one, I think, in terms oh, by, of yeah, by far. cases. It's really too bad. Right. Well, you know, um, the, the, we talked about the, this article that appeared in the Times um, comparing various uh, countries. And some, some areas have done very well. Some mm -hmm. areas have not done very well. Right. And we, what we don't know is why, why some areas do well. It's probably got a lot to do with a lot of things like social distancing and so forth. Right. And yeah. culture. Yeah, um, I think that's a factor. I think um, Japan is more science oriented. There's, there's no dispute in this country when, when doctors come on the TV and say, this is what needs to be done. You know, that doesn't get questioned in the same way I've observed it is in the United States. And also, uh, um, Japan is not as fundamentally based in religion. I mean, this is more of an agnostic country. So we don't have that counterbalance that you have in the United States, religious interests. And, and certainly we don't have people who are carrying machine guns and going into the state government offices. There's none of that kind of pushback whatsoever. There's been no protests. I don't think people are happy about everything that's going on here. I and mean, the government response has been ineffective in some cases, they certainly were slow. But we haven't had that kind of mass resistance or symbolic resistance or anti-science approach or, you know, religious. No, that's, that's great to hear. I mean, it's or the anti-vaxxers or anything like that, fortunately. I, I value, I think everybody values the Japan culture for that, for the sense of orderliness and uh, mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about you. I, I, I'm sort of missing a feeling on you. So oh, okay. you're not teaching per se. You're, well, using, I, you're using Zoom to teach. Um, um, and you're not having meetings with students or, or what? Yeah, we're, we can't. We are no longer able to meet with students. Once the national emergency was instituted last month, that stopped. So all my interaction with students is through, like us right now, through technology. Um, the students um, seem to be managing it fairly well. Um, I, I think I've mentioned I'm teaching an online course with the University of Hawaii West Oahu with Professor Sakuda. Uh, we, we decided to do that last summer, so we're, it's like I <clears throat> was prescient somehow. Yeah, Art serendipitous. Yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. I said, well, you know, maybe we should try experimenting with online education. And now every, everybody's experimenting with online education. So the students seem to be managing, um, you know, their whole, the ones that remained in Japan, they're holed up in their dorms. I'm a little concerned about their mental health and their physical condition. But for the most part, they seem to be managing okay. And um, I'm getting some feedback from my classes. Uh, their group work, surprisingly, Jay, I, I thought it would be rough and, you know, it would deteriorate because now these students are spread out all over the world. You, there's some who are in Europe, you know, in the United States, and some are here in Japan. It's actually better. I think they're recognizing they're facing a challenge, so they're make, making more of an effort to collaborate with each other. I, I'm just surprised. The feedback has been much higher than normal. Well, you know, that's one question, and it has to be my last question. We're, we're almost out of time. As you know, okay, everybody got, got into this kind of blush thing, but we're going to deal with this. We're going to find, you know, uh, uh, energy and strength to deal with it. And um, we're going to do this together. It's a statement of our ability to do things together. 
and, and that, that lasts for a few weeks maybe but you know i'm i'm wondering when that comes to an end uh and when people get tired of that and they mm. become you know become uh, less interested in doing that because they can't see the end they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel mm. uh the government tries to make you feel that oh yeah there's some good good things happening and maybe there are but i, I don't yeah. i don't think a lot of people are persuaded so the mm. question is do you see that happening among your students and the people you associate with that you know they're getting a little antsy about this and they don't they don't feel the end is going to be anytime soon right um, I need to do a little bit more research on that, Jay. Maybe the next time we have the show, I, I can give you a better answer there. Because, like, for example, on Thursday, those students that I've had in the collaboration with West Oahu, I'm going to talk to them and ask them, what do you think about this? You know, how did it go for you? So there's eight students on our side, four are foreigners, uh, two, there's three Europeans and one American, and they had been, they'd taken online courses before, so for them it wasn't a big deal. But I have four Japanese students who had never, they're the only students in all of Kansai Gaide, 13,000 students that have ever taken an online course. So I'm going to talk to them and see what they think about that. And then we're going to do a survey with all of our foreign uh, students as well to try and get a sense of this. Yeah. So well, I, I agree with you. I think the premise of your question is, is right, that students somehow even though it defies my common sense they feel closer to each other because they've gone through this experience even though they don't even see each other it's all been like you and i talking right now yeah and will that carry over you know beyond this particular semester or the next yeah beyond maybe on june who knows when uh, you know because it, yeah it's a fair chance that there won't be any great news <clears throat> so anyway we can talk about that and i would also like to discuss with you so for, for purposes of your inquiries around, mm -hmm. um, you know, how they feel about the uh, reopening and how they feel about, um, you know, a resumption of normal um, educational and economic activity. Yeah, the part of the message last night, I know we're running out of time from Abe, is that yes, the national emergency is going to continue, but some uh, organizations, some businesses will open like libraries. Uh, they're beginning around the edges to begin to open up things. So they're going to go, if you know my sense of how Japan will open, it'll be very, very slow, step by step, very cautiously done, and to make sure that the numbers don't suddenly jump up. That's my guess as to how things will occur here. It won't be, I guess, like in Florida, where they, you know, just okay, let's get back to business. You know, it'll be much more incremental because that fits better with how things are done here in general. Yeah. Oh, we'll be watching. We'll be watching to see how it goes. <laughs> okay. So next time, next time, Steve, looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, very much. So thank you, Jay. It's always fun to talk with you. And I, the number of books, have you read all those books, Jay, the ones that are behind you there? I just want to ask that question. Have you read I'm them I'm working all? my way. I'm working my way through the shelves. Oh, okay. Very good. Thanks for asking, Steve. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> 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 Steve Searcher, Kansai Gadai University. Thank you. Always so a much. pleasure, Jay. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh -huh.